Hello my fellow Gadotians. Today we're going to be checking out a little bit more detail about how memory works and how integral values actually work with memory. So first of all, programs write data to actual memory addresses, right? If you want data, say some integer, it actually shows up at some arbitrary memory address. But how do we reference these, this memory that we're given? Well, C++ uses something called a symbol table, where the symbols, like x, that are associated with a variable are mapped to the actual memory address of where that data exists so that you can reference it later. In JDScript, this would be kind of similar to having a dictionary where you explicitly map the dictionary to some index of a large array, and then you're going to the beginning of some piece of data that you want to keep track of. Now, the question is, how do we know how much data to associate with a value, and how do we know what bits to write to the bytes, right? Or like, how do we know what data to actually put in there? So we have to figure out different pieces of information, and all comes down to the data type. The data type determines how we handle that information. So how many bytes, right? So how do we figure this out? In C++, you actually have an op a built-in operator for it called size of, where you can supply the data type and it tells you how many bytes are present in it. So here's size of int. It could conceivably give out four, so then we would know that that's the case. Um, the program will actually see all the variables laid out sequentially in memory, regardless of whether or not they actually are, because the OS can move stuff around. But the program will see it as, here's the data, Here's the next bit of data, they're right next to each other. So in order to know where to write the second piece of data, I need to know how much space is required for the preceding bit of data. Otherwise you could be writing to the same, you know, region of memory for both variables. Um, so there are a couple of different ways that we can express integral values. Um, you can just use a plain decimal context where there's no modifications to it. Um, you can use straight binary where you use a B suffix. Um, you can use octal, where values range from 0 to 7, and every four digits represents a byte. And you can accomplish this by using a zero prefix, and then all the remaining data is actually the value that you're putting into the variable. Um, and then the most common one you'll see, aside from decimal, is hexadecimal, where you use a 0x prefix, and the values range from 0 to 15, so they supplement the top level uh, or the, the higher numbers with A through F to replace 10 through 15. And in this case, every two digits represents a single byte. So this is actually four bytes of information just from this little bit here. Now, how are the bits actually arranged inside that region? That was the other question we had. Well, in integral values, the most common representation is something called two's complement. So the leading bit will be used to signal whether the value is negated, whether you have a negative value or not. And then all the remaining bits will be used for the actual value. So in this case, I have 0 and 1, which look pretty much normal. But then I have negative 1, and we have all Fs. So why do they do this, right? Why do we not have just 8 and a whole bunch of zeros? Because 8 has the leading 1 bit. Well, it's because there's a special strategy where they can flip all of the bits and add one to it to negate the value, and it doesn't matter which direction you're going, right? So if I have one and I flip all of the bits and then I add one to it, I get the negative one representation. And likewise, if I go the other direction, I do the same thing. So this, this little trick um, makes it a lot easier to work with the data in the CPU. Uh, the other thing to note is that the data types actually control the interpretation of the bits that are present in memory. So you've heard of casting, where you're converting from one type to another. GDescript does it with these global functions that are provided, right? String, int, you can nest them together. Um, you just kind of pass data in. In C++, um, you actually can create like qualifiers on your data types, or you could use entirely different data types potentially. And if you are trying to have a value be used here, right? So we have negative one, and that is the all Fs value, right? It was earlier. But here, because it's an unsigned int, we actually have a very high number rather than a negative number. 
And this happens because of a cast we are performing, whether we know it or not. So signed int is the data type that all literals, these things here, the 0, 1, and negative 1, that's a literal. If you, if you just give a literal that's in a decimal form, it's going to be a signed int type. Um, and so we're converting from a signed int to an unsigned int, so we're performing a cast. Specifically, we're performing a static cast, which is a compile time conversion. The engine will actually tell, or the, it's not the engine, but the C++ compiler will tell you directly if the types aren't compatible and they can't transition from one to the other. Like, it, it'll tell you if it's not supported. Um, there's an implicit static cast where you just kind of do it, which is what we were doing before, and it's not explicitly stated, but we are performing that cast. Whereas here, rather than having a global function of some sort, you use parentheses surrounding the type name, and this parenthesized type name is actually applied to whatever expression is on the right side of it. And then this has now been converted and then is passed into the unsigned int. That's, that's the way this expression works. So this stuff is just talking about what I just stated. Um, so if you wanted to wrap parenthesized you know, casts that you're doing, um, you actually will want to put this extra set of parentheses around it when you're applying this integer to it, just for better readability. Um, you'll want to be doing that. Uh, it might also be mandatory, I'm not sure, but I, I always do this. So <laughs> you, gener you generally want to do that just to make it clear what's going on in your code. Um, now, are there other ways that the data types can be manipulated? So yes, there's all kinds of different byte sizes for in integral values, right? So I have char, short, int, long, and long, long. And these are all in, in increasingly minimum required sizes. And I say minimum required because there's no explicit standard saying how many there should be for a, a given data type. It just says there should be a minimum set of bits, which means it's up to the compiler that is compiling your code into an executable to decide how many bytes it wants to execute or allocate for the variables. Um, and because of this, you always want to remember to use size of on the type whenever you have code that is dependent on the size of the data. Uh, if you're wanting to allocate like some multiple of whatever the data type size is to get a certain number of bytes allocated for something, like in order to do things like that, you need to use size of because there's, you can't just put four or two or something like that because you don't know how many bytes are actually going to be used for your data. So always remember to use size of. Um, now GDScript, I've mentioned here, only only uses 64-bit signed integers. They don't have all these different sizes. They don't worry about it. And the reason for that is because they don't want to have to worry about you know figuring out how to place things in memory so that they're packed in appropriately even with different sizes, they're like, no, I just want to have one way to do it so I don't have to statically type everything. I want to have it dynamically typed. I want a fixed size for all the data so that I don't care what it is. And that's exactly what they do. You know, they just say, you know, I don't need to calculate the integer size if you just always use the biggest one. Like, it's not an issue for me, no problem. Um, and that's, that's just what GDScript does. Uh, and this does, the, the byte sizes in C++ can affect your um, operations, which it, uh, there's, there are things that can happen in GDScript too, I guess, with underflows and overflows, if you're combining big numbers together. But it's even more apparent in C++ because it happens at a smaller scale when you're working with even smaller numbers. So uh, if I have a character value, so char C of 1, and then I put it in a larger number, all these extra bits on the left get filled in with zeros. If I go the other direction, and I have this one over here and two zeros, well, the char only needs the two zeros bit on the right. So this one actually gets cut off and truncated, and we lose it during the transition. So that's truncating the value. Now, um, there's also underflow and overflow. So this is where if I have, say, an unsigned int at zero and I subtract one from it, I actually, to perform the subtraction successfully, I have to go to like the next highest number to grab a value, and then I 
you know, ma reset all the remaining values for the subtraction, but that just ends up flipping the value because I don't have a way of expressing like the next lowest, um, you know, most or the the lower number for the highest bit. Like I don't have that bit, so I really just underflowed and became a really big number. Um, now for an overflow, like if I have a signed integer and I'm at the maximum value and I add one, I'm suddenly going to be at the most negative value and I'm going to have this like really negative number. Um, so that's just something that you have to be mindful of with these types. Now um, in GDScript, you can load a class into a given name and you can kind of rename it with an alias where you just say, okay, I'm going to assign this name to a different name and now I can use both of these names to refer to the type. In C++, um, it's a different story because the, the, the type names are not values in C++. You can't take a, take, you can't like take type, you know, class A and assign it to a variable and then assign that to another variable. Like you can't assign the types to variables at all. They're in a whole different plane of existence. So um, they actually have a special keyword called type def for creating aliases of type names. Um, so here I'm saying A is renamed to AA uh, and, and now both of these names are compatible with each other. So if I say A, 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 and then double A, double A, and I've created instances of these, now A and double A are both objects that are instances of the A class. So even though I've called this double A, it's actually an A. And you can do the same kind of thing with integer values too. So there are um, built-in type defs, well not built-in, but there's a library that gets included, um, where C++ actually has a whole bunch of really helpful, more explicitly defined sizes and signs for integral values that you can use. Um, and so anything that you have an underscore T is gonna be this kind of custom type that's used for stuff. Um, size T is something that you find often with data structures. If you have like, oh, I want to know what size something is or allocate some positive, non-negative, you know, number that's big, you'll use size T for that. And it'll just use whatever the biggest positive number it can from the native platform. Um, and then enums are the last bit. So in GDScript, an enum value is actually a dictionary that just maps the string keys to the integer values. And you can demonstrate this by getting the size, getting the keys, iterating through the keys, and getting a string. Like you could do all that stuff. In C, you're really doing a whole new type declaration, but it's for one or more integral values only. Um, and you're not actually creating a new, th these things aren't actual types so much as they're symbols associated with. The, um, the number value. So this, the suit bit is a type name. So you can, this is in the same domain as like, you know, doing class A or something, um, but it only accepts and holds one integral value. And you could really hold, put any integral value in, it doesn't really care. So remember what I said about C++ being dumb. It doesn't really keep track of the fact that you're trying to assign a not suit approved value to this suit variable. It's just like, oh, that's a number. Okay, let's go. You know? um, and you can, you'll can you notice you can't get the size or anything like that. There are no members. There's no functions or anything like that. You can't, you can't call something on an enum. But this little trick is using the last element of the definition as a way to keep track of the size because since it's zero indexed, the last element always tells you the total number of elements in the preceding part of the definition. So you can use that to tell you how many elements there are. Well, this is kind of a quick overview of how integral values worked. Um, next episode, we'll be covering the rest of the primitive types in C++ and getting into some pointer stuff. Hope you guys enjoyed the lesson and stick around for the next episode. See ya.